So in this video, I'm going to be naming some more World Economic Forum connections from around the world. But this time I will also be focusing on the ones who are connected to the Trilateral Commission, because it seems that a lot of people don't know much about the Trilateral Commission and it really is important that you do. It's just as important as the World Economic Forum. Both of these institutions were established when the technocrats decided that they needed more formal platforms to use to promote their ideas, such as globalization and a one world technocratic government. Essentially, the new international economic order were a few control the many. So whilst Klaus Schwab created the World Economic Forum, David Rockefeller created the Trilateral Commission along with Sabiga Brzezinski. The World Economic Forum was initially called the European Management Forum and was renamed in 1987 when they decided it was time to move to a global management organisation and was cleverly rebranded as the World Economic Forum. At the time, the technocrats already had a few think tanks that had long been established, such as the Fabian Society in 1884 and Chatham House in the UK in 1920, and was created at the same time as its sister organisation, the Council on Foreign Relations in the USA in 1921. And of course, the technocrats had also created the Bilderberg Group in 1954, which both Klaus Schwab and David Rockefeller were on the steering committee of, along with Henry Kissinger. And of course, there was the Club of Rome established in 1968, all of these organisations were serving their purpose in getting the world's most powerful and influential together behind closed doors to collaborate on a one world ruling plan and scientific dictatorship. So by the early 1970s, they took the next step and established two more platforms, two more institutions, the World Economic Forum and the Trilateral Commission. The World Economic Forum serves as the public relations department for the new international economic order serving as a recruitment agency for bringing those from the public on board and into the cult. Many of the World Economic Forum members are a part of the larger plan, whilst many are not. They are just simply there because they have bought into the marketing of this institution. They have been seduced, whether that is for their own selfish purposes, such as wanting to make money amongst many other benefits, or whether it is because they really believe that they are going to save the world. As Carl Jung said, people don't have ideas. Ideas have people. I think that explains a lot on how this agenda has been able to get so many well-meaning people on board to carry out their dirty work. So whilst the Trilateral Commission sits in the shadows, barely gaining any attention, they are the guiding force and also the driving force for the new world order. And they are very involved with the World Economic Forum they are the cult leaders, ensuring that their public relations department runs smoothly and on time. When the Trilateral Commission was officially founded in 1973, they called their version of technocracy the New International Economic Order, where grabbing resources became the master plan and sustainable development, which is the biggest front for technocracy, became the means to that end. When you hear the term sustainable development, it really is just a cover for technocracy. So I want to go through some of the Trilateral Commission members who are also World Economic Forum members and in many cases are also members of one or more of the other think tanks that I just mentioned before, all which are used as engine rooms for creating their policies, partnerships and programs to establish their technocracy. So Klaus Schwab, for example, is merely just one technocrat. He serves as the public front man and the World Economic Forum plays a very important role as the facilitator. The people I'm going to name today are just as instrumental as Klaus Schwab in the establishment of the new international economic order, and in some cases, even more instrumental. But just before I jump into all of that, for those of you who don't know what a technocrat is and what a technocracy is, I will give you a really quick rundown. So the best way to describe it is a scientific dictatorship a society ran by experts. So even if you've never heard of technocracy before, you would have heard of its many fronts under different names, such as sustainable development, the green economy, global warming and climate change, cap and trade, agenda 21, common core state standards, public private partnerships, and smart growth, just to name a few. 
All of these programs were created by the technocrats to achieve their final destination of a new international economic order. And to back that statement up, all you need to do is start looking at who the members are of the Trilateral Commission, and you will find that all of these ideas and programs originated and are being implemented by the technocrats of this very institution. If we look at the definition of the word itself, it states that a technocrat is a technical expert. And it goes on to explain that in 1919, W.H. Smith or Smythe coined the term technocracy to mean basically management of society by technical experts. Now, this is something that we have all recently experienced in the last three years. It really went into overdrive when we started hearing the term trust the experts a whole lot more than ever before. Trust the science, trust the scientists, don't question the experts. So as it explains here, technocracy grew into a movement during the Great Depression of the 1930s when politicians and financial institutions were being blamed for the economic disaster and fans of technocracy claimed that letting technical experts manage the country would be a great improvement they also suggested that dollars could be replaced by energy certificates representing energy units called ERGs. Sounds awfully familiar, doesn't it? Because that is where we now find ourselves. We are a hop, skip and a jump away from an economy based on sustainable development, an energy-based, resource-based economy where we are tracked, traced, and monitored via surveillance systems, all connected to the Internet of Things. Modern technocrats and transhumanists believe in the philosophy or the notion that science and technology can somehow establish a perfect society through careful scientific management and the merging of humans with technology in every sense. In their own words from 1938, they say that technocracy is the science of social engineering, the scientific operation of the entire social mechanism to produce and distribute goods and services to the entire population, ran by a small group of corporate scientific experts. So in short, it's social engineering and a world where less than 0.1% of the population manages more than 99.9% .9 of the population all in the name of the greater good. They have been working very cleverly in establishing their end goal, moving toward it inch by inch through patient gradualism over the generations, which they have almost successfully achieved. The word itself is derived from the Greek words techni, meaning skill, and kratos, meaning power, as in governance or rule. Thus, it is governance by skilled engineers, scientists, and technicians, as opposed to elected officials. Make no mistakes, they are anti-government. They have worked hard to infiltrate and position their members in office to integrate their plan, whilst at the same time weakening our government institutions. So we lose faith in our government leaders, and then in turn, it shows the people that the government cannot be trusted so that we, the people, are the ones in the end who beg for the experts to take over. As one trilateralist stated in 1974, Richard Gardner, he says, in short, the house of world order will have to be built from the bottom up rather than from the top down. It will look like a great booming, buzzing confusion, but an end run around national sovereignty, eroding it piece by piece, will accomplish much more than the old-fashioned frontal assault. Okay, so let's have a look at the Trilateral Commission's website and we'll look at who some of the members are. I recommend that you spend some time on this website. You'll be surprised at what you find. Uh, if you're wanting to look up the members yourself, you just scroll down and there is a leadership members and fellows section where you can look people up. And when you go into that, actually, if you don't find a particular person in the search area, 
You can also download their PDF because that also includes previous trilateralists, but this will give you a little bit of a overview. But there is approximately 400 uh, current serving members at any one time, and they do come and go. And it depends on a few reasons, but I will probably go into that another time because that'll just eat up time. <laughs> um, obviously, Henry Kissinger's always been a part of it and is still a part of it. Um, and if you don't know who he is, then you've got some catching up to do. I can actually post a, um, a video on Henry Kissinger in the comments if you're wanting to know more about him, but I won't waste my time covering him. Uh, okay, so let's look at our first member. So Rajiv Shah, he's the president of the Rockefeller Foundation and the former administrator for the US Agency for International Development. He's also a young global leader for the World Economic Forum from the class of 2007 and a World Economic Forum agenda contributor. He is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and he did work for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So he held numerous leadership roles there for almost a decade from 2001. And he had many roles, including being the Director of Strategic Opportunities, Agricultural Development, the Deputy Director of Policy and Finance, a Chief Economist. He was also responsible for developing the International Finance Facility for a Certain Pharmaceutical Product which raised more than $5 billion for the Global Alliance for that particular pharmaceutical product. He is also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, along with people like Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Bill Gates, Bill Gates's dad, um, Henry Kissinger, Mark Benioff, uh, who was also a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader, and he's the founder of Salesforce. And that's just naming a few. This organization actually deserves a whole video of its own. So he's currently the president of the Rockefeller Foundation and has been since March 2017. And I'll read a little bit. So in 2009, he was appointed USA ID administrator by President Obama and unanimously confirmed by the US Senate, Dr. Shah reshaped the $20 billion agencies' operations in more than 70 countries around the world by elevating the role of innovation, creating high-impact public-private partnerships and focusing U.S. investments to deliver stronger results. Shah secured bipartisan support that included the passage of two significant laws, the Global Food Security Act and the Electrify Africa Act. He led the U.S. response to the Haiti earthquake and the West African Ebola pandemic. He served on the National Security Council and elevated the role of development as part of our nation's foreign policy. Prior to his appointment at USAID, he served as Chief Scientist and Undersecretary for Research, Education and Economics at the US Department of Agriculture, where he created the National Institute for Food and Agriculture. He also founded Latitude Capital, which is a private equity firm. Uh, he also served on the UN's high-level panel on pandemics and taught as a distinguished fellow in residence at Georgetown University. He also happens to be a commissioner on the Lancet Commission for COVID-19, and he's also on so many boards. I would be here all day if I <laughs> listed them all. So he's an expert on pandemics, and what a coincidence. He just happens to also be an expert on climate change and sustainability, energy, agriculture. Um, he also happens to be coincidentally involved with artificial intelligence. Um, the list is endless. He just has his hands in all the pies. So I'm going to finish off this segment on Rajiv by playing one of his recent announcements on behalf of the Rockefeller Foundation. Being bold means reimagining the world and coming up with the ideas and resources to make change at global scale. That's what we're trying to do at the Rockefeller Foundation. We're investing $1 billion over the next three years to unleash an energy-enabled green enterprise revolution. With breakthroughs in solar, battery storage, and artificial intelligence, we can unlock opportunities for billions of people by scaling up renewable electrification 
in a manner that delivers energy needed for communities to compete in the global economy. Over the next decade, working together with Sustainable Energy for All and our partners around the world, the Rockefeller Foundation will directly contribute to this goal by securing a new productive rural energy minimum of 300 kilowatts per capita for the 1 billion people who live in energy poor villages and rural communities. This clean energy will support new small businesses, create green jobs, spur education and healthcare, and grow local economies, at least doubling families' incomes and enabling them to move permanently out of poverty. Okay, so on to the next mover and shaker. Mark Carney, member of the Trilateral Commission. He was the governor for the Bank of Canada from 2008 to 2013, and then the governor for the Bank of England from 2013 to 2020. He also worked for Goldman Sachs from about 1990 until 2003. And he's also a World Economic Forum member and agenda contributor. He was also on the World Economic Forum Board of Trustees as well. And he attended the London School of Economics. He's also involved with KPMG. And he is a member of the Group of 30, along with many other trilateral members. And you can find him here, right next to Augustine Carstens, uh, the General Manager for the Bank for International Settlements, which Mark actually also served on as a chairman uh, on the Bank for International Settlements Committee on the Global Financial System from 2010, July, until January 2012. If you don't know what the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, is, it's the bank for all of the central banks. You can't get any higher than that. And Mark is currently the Vice Chair for Brookfield Asset Management Incorporated, which is a Canadian multinational company that is one of the world's largest alternative investment management companies with over US $725 billion of assets under management in 2022, where he leads the firm's ESG, which is Environmental, Social and Governance and Impact Fund Investment Strategy. He also attends the Bilderberg meetings. Not only that, He's also on the Bilderberg Steering Committee. And he's also a member of Chatham House. He's also the UN Special Envoy on Climate Action and Finance. In 2020, Boris Johnson appointed Mark to the position of Finance Advisor for the UK Presidency of the COP26 UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, which ended up taking place in November 2021. He's also a UN thought leader. And on October 30th last year, he declared that the world of finance would be judged on the $100 trillion climate challenge, now elevated apparently to $130 trillion. So his COP private finance strategy has devised 24 significant initiatives to build a financial system in which every decision made takes climate change into account. To supercharge these reforms, the UN and the COP26 presidency have created the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero, GFANZ, and this alliance garners the most ambitious firms in every sector of finance from every continent. He is on so many boards, which includes the boards of Bloomberg Philanthropies, the Peterson Institute for International Economics and the Hoffman Institute for Global Business and Society at INSEAD. So the next technocrat and trilateral commission member is Jared Cohen, and he was a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader from the class of 2014, and he is also a World Economic Forum Agenda Contributor. He is a member for Climate One, an organization that addresses the climate emergency. And he's currently serving 
as the President of Global Affairs and co-head of the Office of Applied Innovation at Goldman Sachs. He is the former CEO of Jigsaw and the founder, and that was formerly called Google Ideas. He worked for the US State Department, and during his time there, he was an advisor to both Condoleezza Rice and Hillary Clinton. He attends Bilderberg meetings, as well as being a member and a scientific expert for the Council on Foreign Relations. He is an expert in terrorism and counterterrorism, Iran, and technology and innovation. And he's a part of the Digital and Cyberspace Policy Program. And he was the chief advisor to Google's CEO and executive chairman, Eric Schmidt, who he co-authored a book with. Uh, the book is called The New Digital Age, Reshaping the Future of People, Nations and Business. It's all about the digital smart cities of the future and the role of technology in reshaping people and the world, whether we like it or not. And Jared and Eric have worked closely together for years. So I wasn't surprised when their book came out. Eric Schmidt is also a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader from the class of 1997. And he's also a World Economic Forum agenda contributor and a regular to Davos. And as of April this year, he's ranked as the 54th richest person in the world on the Bloomberg Billionaires Index. And he's also a Bilderberg meeting participant. And as well as that, he is also on the steering committee for the Bilderberg group. And he is also <laughs> a member for the Council on Foreign Relations. So since leaving Google, Eric has been running his own organization called Schmidt Futures Initiative, where he funds core research in fields like artificial intelligence, biology, and energy. And on his team, you will find some interesting people, including George W. Bush's daughter, Barbara Bush. And Eric also co-wrote a book with another Trilateral Commission member, Henry Kissinger. The book is called The Age of AI, which lays out a roadmap of what technology's future could look like. So in December, he also became a strategic advisor for San Francisco-based research initiative, Chainlink Labs, which uses blockchain technology to build smart contracts that he says encourages economic fairness, transparency, and efficiency. If you haven't yet heard about smart contracts, I promise you, you will be in the very near future. So back to Jared. Uh, he has also served on many advisory boards, including those of Allianz, ASAPP, Fluid Market, the National Counterterrorism Center, Rivet Ventures, the Secretary of State Foreign Affairs Policy Board, and Stanford University's Freeman Spogley Institute for International Studies. So he's an expert on climate, sustainability, smart cities, artificial intelligence, technology and innovation, terrorism, as well as government policy. Are you starting to see how the lines between government and corporations have become so blurred? Speaking of government, the next technocrat and trilateral commission member is Halle Thorning-Schmidt, the former Prime Minister of Denmark from 2011 to 2015. And she's also on the Trilateral Commission Task Force on Global Capitalism in Transition. She's listed right down here at the bottom. Now, she is on that task force with Mark Carney, who we've already spoken about, and is on the task force along with former Australian Minister for Foreign Affairs and Deputy Leader of the Liberal Party, Julie Bishop who also happens to be a member of the Trilateral Commission, obviously, because she's also on the task force, but I'll talk more about her in a couple of minutes. And Hallie is also on the Council on Foreign Relations Global Board of Advisors, and she's down here. And then we also find on list Julie Bishop who's currently the Chancellor of the Australian National University. 
Okay, so Hallie Thorning Schmidt is also uh, a World Economic Forum member and agenda contributor. And she's also on the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship. And she's also uh, a member of the 21st Central Council for the Bergruen Institute. And the Bergruen Institute is a science and future biotech organization that focuses on gene editing, artificial intelligence, and brain interfacing. And she is also on the Every Woman, Every Child Global Strategy UN Advisory Group, as well as the European Council for Foreign Relations, and is also on the Board of Trustees for the European Council for Foreign Relations. And she's also a co-chair of Facebook's Oversight Board. So that's the board that makes uh, precedent-setting content moderation decisions on both Facebook and Instagram. Uh, Hallie not only attends Davos, but in 2017, she was also a co-chair there at Davos. She's the CEO of Save the Children International and on the board for the Centre for Global Development, European Advisory Group and the Atlantic Council and so much more. Okay, so back to Julie Bishop. As I mentioned, she is a Trilateral Commission member and is also on the Task Force on Global Capitalism in Transition, as well as a member of the CFR and is also on the Global Board of Advisors for the Council on Foreign Relations. And after a long career in Australian politics, she is now the Chancellor at the Australian National University. And she's also a member of the World Economic Forum and has attended Davos. And Julie is also a World Economic Forum agenda contributor. And she is on the MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology AI, so Artificial Intelligence Policy Forum Steering Committee. MIT has played a key role in the development of modern technology and science. She also attended Harvard Business School and the Harvard Kennedy School Balfour Center for Science and International Affairs. She was awarded the Kissinger Fellowship at the McCain Institute of International Leadership. Uh, she also served as Minister for Education, Science and Training, Minister for Women's Issues and Minister for Aging. And she is a fellow of the Australian Institute of International Affairs and a member of the International Advisory Boards of Affinity. Now, Affinity is an artificial intelligence software company. And of course, a member of the International Advisory Board for the Human V Project, think pharmaceutical products. So here is a picture of Julie attending a roundtable luncheon on smart cities in New York in 2017. So she's been fairly involved with smart cities. And also here is an article from back in 2018 when Julie was the Australian foreign minister. Australia invests $30 million to help develop smart and sustainable cities across, across Southeast Asia and also said that her country will also provide training and technical assistance to build these resilient and competitive communities. It's called the Asian Australia Smart Cities Initiative. As I mentioned, she is currently the Chancellor at the ANU. She's also on their COVID-19 committee. And there are also several other Australian technocrats that are members of the Trilateral Commission and who are also connected to the Australian National University. I won't go into all of their details right now, but I do recommend that you look them up and see how involved they are with COVID and climate change, corporate governance, smart cities, and artificial intelligence. Okay, the next mover and shaker is Jacob Wallenberg, member of the Trilateral Commission. I have spoken about him before in my Young Global Leader class of 1993 video because he was in that class um, as a Young Global Leader for the World Economic Forum. And as I explained in that, he's a Swedish banker and he serves uh, as a board member for multiple companies. 
And the Wallenberg family are a prominent Swedish family, uh, Europe's most powerful business family. And they're noted as bankers, politicians, bureau- bureaucrats, and diplomats. Uh, the Wallenberg Spheres Holdings employ about 600,000 people, and their business empire includes pharmaceuticals, Ericsson, Saab, and NASDAQ. And the Wallenberg family have a wealth of over $200 billion. So the Wallenberg family also own Investor, and that's also a World Economic Forum partner organization. And they founded that just over 100 years ago. It's involved in global investment, including technology, engineering, and sustainability, financial services, pharmaceuticals, and healthcare. And Jacob's cousin, Marcus Wallenberg, he's also been a member of the Trilateral Commission, and he was also a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader uh, the year after Jacob in 1994. And he serves on many boards also, including one of our favourite pharmaceutical companies. And he's currently on the steering committee for the Bilderberg meetings. And their grandfather, Marcus Wallenberg Jr., was also a member of the steering committee. So they created uh, WASP. And WASP stands for Wallenberg AI, so Artificial Intelligence, Autonomous Systems and Software Programs. So they're heavily invested in artificial intelligence as well. And while we're talking about bankers, uh, Robert B. Zolik, member of the Trilateral Commission. So he was the president of the World Bank from 2007 until 2012. And he now serves on the board of Twitter. <laughs> Uh, He is also a member of the World Economic Forum, and he was actually nominated for the position of president of the World Bank by George W. Bush at the time, uh, that he was an executive at Goldman Sachs. And as you know, Goldman Sachs is a World Economic Forum partner organization. And Robert is also a Bilderberg meeting participant, and he is also a member of of the Council on Foreign Relations. There are a lot of trilateral members that are either currently on the BIS board or have been at some stage. As I mentioned before, the BIS, the Bank for International Settlements, is the bank of all central banks. It is the head of the snake, so to speak. It was established in 1930 and its head office is in Switzerland. So there is Jean-Pierre Roth, who served on the BIS board from 06 until 09, and he was also the governor of the IMF. He has attended Davos several times. He worked for the Swiss National Bank for 30 years. He is the man who is said to be responsible for devaluing the Swiss franc by flooding the market with printed Swiss francs and also by selling 1,300 tonnes of Switzerland's gold. He is also on the board for Nestle, the board of directors, which is also a World Economic Forum partner organization, and also MKS, which is a trader of precious metals, and also a WEF partner organization, and the Swatch Group, which Klaus Schwab also once served on the board of. And he also studied at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and Axel A. Weber, Trilateral Commission member has also served for the BIS and uh, Class Not is currently serving uh, on the board for the BIS. He's listed here next to Christine Lagarde. And there was Lucas Papathemos who served on the Central Bank Governance Group at the Bank for International Settlements. He holds many degrees from MIT He also held positions at the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank. He was the governor of the Bank of Greece from 94 to 2002 and many other positions. He was also a professor at the University of Athens and served on the faculty for Columbia University and the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. And he was the prime minister of Greece for about six months. He was installed as the prime minister of Greece on the 11th of the 11th 11. And at the same time, just within two days of each other, um, Mario Monti, a fellow technocrat and member of the Trilateral Commission, became the Prime Minister of Italy. 
Both of these men, trilateral members, were rushed into head emergency governments because of a fear-driven campaign that if the experts didn't step in, then both countries would end up in financial ruin. The people of Greece and Italy were told that these experts were the only chance they had to fix the mess that their elected politicians had led them into. Mario Monti also founded his own think tank in 2005 called Bruegel, I think that's how it's pronounced, which is based in Brussels. He has also attended Davos. He's a World Economic Forum member and a World Economic Forum agenda contributor. He's also a member of the Club of Madrid, along with our very own Kevin Rudd. And in 2020, he was appointed by the World Health Organization to chair the Pan-European Commission on Health and Sustainable Development. He was on the Bilderberg Steering Committee for many years and was an international advisor to Goldman Sachs and the Coca-Cola Company. So Mario's son, Giovanni Monti, has been influential in the medical field now since at least 2011. Prior to that, he was the vice president of Morgan Stanley and Citigroup, as well as a consultant for Bain & Co., and did a summer internship for the World Trade Organization and the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. And that's just a brief summary on what he's involved with. Uh, Mario Monti's daughter, uh, her name is Federica Monti. She's a teacher at the Global Management for China and an author of several scientific publications, a researcher and lecturer of Chinese commercial law, international trade and world trade organization rules and is also a business lawyer and if you dig a little deeper you'll also find that she's involved with China and Europe's partnership for a more sustainable world a four-year project on partnership opportunities between Europe and China in the renewable energy and environmental industries which was financed by the European Commission and has a focus on the green sector and sustainable growth so have a look through the website for the Trilateral Commission. And if you put in terms like Bank for International Settlements, you'll see a whole bunch more uh, trilateral members that have been or are currently involved with the Bank for International Settlements. It's mind-blowing. And when you go through these people's profiles, it isn't going to tell you everything in their bio. You have to do some searches on them to find out what initiatives they are involved with, what boards they are on, and what they have invested in. You will notice the same institutions and organizations coming up time and time again in relation to these people and also the intergenerational connections and ties.